But I'm going to begin introductions while people are still trickling in. So this is Color Grading 101 by Digital Vision World. Today we're joined by Chris Packman, who will be taking us through Color Grading 101 with you all. This is part of a three-part series, kind of introducing you to the world of grading. Um, we're also joined by Mark Coleman, who is hidden away from us at the moment, our head of global sales, who will be around for the Q&A session at the end. So Chris will take it away for us. And then at the end, we will hold a 10 minute Q&A for you all. So welcome, Chris. Hello, everyone. Hello. Right. Let's do a little bit of um, theory, first of all. So let's take this. Share that. Right, okay. So, so, a bit of basic colorimetry to start with. This is what's called a CIE 1931 chromaticity diagram. Some of you may have seen it before, they're fairly well known. Um, the large colored area is the spectrum that can be seen by the human eye. The little white triangle in the middle is a typical HT is what's called HDTV gamut, which is what's called Rec 709, which is the standard that we work to for HDTV. So as you can see, the camera can actually see quite a limited range of colours, and this presents us with some issues in grading. Uh, there are colours which just don't work, and you can see just from the diagram straight away that cyan you're going to have troubles with. Because as you can see, cyan is only is only a, there's only a little bit of cyan, and we always used to have terrible problems with with cyan back in PAL days. Um, this is the the three color spaces in common use in television. Uh, the the first one is good old Rec 709, which is the, the, the smallest one. That was developed from Rec 601, the um, the 625 line color standard, um, and covers. Uh, a fairly limited range. The second range you see there is what's called DCI P3, and that's the co projection color standard. That's the standard you'll see in your local cinema. So that gives you a bit more color, uh, but not much. The third standard, Rec 2020, is the new standard for HDR. And as you can see, that gives you quite a bit more range, and that's coming in, as I say, with HDR. Um, so Color space is getting bigger, but you have to be aware there's only so much of it and you can only reproduce so much of it. And some colors may fight you and you have to be aware of that. Video scopes are your best friend. Um, in the world of television now and film as well, there are immense numbers of quality checks put on our masters and they are even more thorough and the programs that can check them are even more powerful. So you producing a decent master that is correct and doesn't exceed any of the parameters is really, really important. So you must watch your scopes. The scope on the, the, the top left hand corner shows you is what we call a parade display. And it shows you the amount of red, green and blue in the signal. And as you can see for a fairly neutral image, which we've got on the left, they're fairly even, which is, which is correct, is what you'd expect. The right, top right-hand waveform is what's called the luminance. And the luminance is, is what, what it's the black and white, the luminance signal was, was derived to be the black and white equivalent of a color signal. Um, it's part, part and parcel of the TV system. Um, it's given by an equation that goes somewhere along the line of, um, of luminance equals 0.59 green plus 0.3 red plus 0.11 blue. Um, that is the old PAL numbers, but the, the, H, the HDTV numbers are pretty similar. The uh, P3 numbers are pretty similar, and even the 2020 numbers are not that dissimilar. So that's what luminance comes from. But luminance shows you the overall brightness of the image, and it's a really, really important parameter. Down on the left, we've got the phase, which comes, it's what's called a vector scope, and it's showing us the colors as a vector. Uh, some, and it shows us the amount of those colors. And as you can see from my little color color chart on the left, they're pretty saturated, so they're right out in the boxes. Um, they're really 
quite bright colours, so we've got plenty of movement on our vector scope. Some people swear by them. I'm not a great believer. If you've got the limiter, limiter set, you're not going to go over the edge, so not a problem. But as I say, some people love their vector scopes. The right hand diagram is a new one on me. I found this when I was looking for this. This is a, a chromaticity diagram and it's actually showing us the chromaticity in the, in the little TIE 1931 graph. Rather nice. Um, not seen that one before. Quite nice. Colour scaling and legal and full range. That if you've really, if you're going to get into grading, you've really got to understand this. In a 10 bit system, Black is represented by the value of 64 and white is represented by 940. This is said to be what's called legally scaled. And in the new coder, this is called video SMPTE. The reason for this is originally in the old Rec 601 days, there was headroom in the video waveform left for in the digital waveform for overshoots and things like that. That headroom has been retained and now it's the normal mode of operation for most programs and most work. If you use the full extent of the signal, it, from naught to 1024, the signal is said to be fully scaled or new coder full range. Not much uses this these days. However, Adobe Premiere uses it. So if you're coming from Adobe Premiere, be careful that it's not full range. Um, Nucoda uh, can cope with it, you just need to set it to, to, to Nucoda full range. It's essential that you get the correct colour scaling for playback of a file or severe programs problems will be caused. At the film school we get a lot of tears due to this. Um, I do a grade one day and I meet the cinematographer outside the following day and he says, Chris, it's all milky. Well, here's the answer. If a legal signal is replayed as full, the resultant picture will have lifted blacks and a lot of loss of contrast. If a full range signal is replayed as legal, then the resultant picture will be clipped and have cliff cluck. Let's start again. The resultant playback will have clipped, crushed blacks and whites and increased contrast. So all in all, get it wrong and it looks horrible. Um, as I say, we get this one a lot. Um, it causes tears. And if you've done a grade and your client comes to you and says, oh, it's all milky, they've probably got the colour scaling wrong on the playback. It's patterns, incre it's incredibly common. So just keep an eye on colour scaling. It's, it's going to come and haunt you. You won't get away with it. It will come and haunt you. Most of the images we work with today are in what's called log format. Recording the images in this format enables much extra detail to be retained for later in the grade. Log, image, uh, log images uncorrected look flat and desaturated. Bringing them to normal is often achieved by the use of a, a lookup table or LUT. As you can see in this little demo slide, the difference between the log and the, and the, and the LUTID output is, is night and day. Here's a little comparison of some of the different formats of log. If we look at the top, top curve, that's a linear curve. Um, the, the, the second one down is what's called Cineon log. And this is the, the format from which all of these logs, logs came. Cineon log you'll meet in log scans. These will come from a scanner and from a film original. And it, it's what's called Cineon log. The second curve down is called ARRI log C. And this is the, the curve used by the ARRI Alexa. Very, very common. Uh, a nice log curve works really, really well. Canon log, as you can see, it's very similar to the Simeon log, works really well. Red log film is the the gamma used by um, the, the the red 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 film the red series of cameras. So you can see that's quite a soft log. So there are variations within them. They're all different in their own little way, but they're all log curves ultimately. And so they're all they're all. They've all got similar, they're just a different equation. One of the things I like to, to, to promote is what I call a LUTID work, workflow. Um, it's a really good way to work um, and makes things really easy for everyone involved in the show. Prior to the start of the production, the cinematographer shoots some tests and agrees with the colorist a LUT to be used on the rushes for the show. 
on e as each day's rushes come in, proxies for the offline are produced with the LUT baked in. During the edit, the director and the editor will now see the show as intended by the cinematographer, because they'll be looking at LUTed rushes. Because viewing the other good things, viewing copies made, made from our offline will also have the LUT baked in. So the exec producer is going to see it properly as intended as well. In the grade, the camera rushes are ingested and the LUT imported back in to the grading system. This gives you a known starting point from which the grade can begin. This start point will be familiar to the cinematographer, director and colorist, as it should be exactly the same as they saw in the offline and the viewing copies. So you know where you're starting from. You know that the scene in the bedroom in the first half is a bit warm. You know that the exterior just before the murder needs to be a bit colder. You know that the, the dream sequence needs to be a bit more extreme. It, it's a really nice way to work. So that's the LUTed workflow. Camera LUTs. Camera LUTs are supplied by the camera manufacturer as they know the full details of the hardware being used. They're usually downloadable from the manufacturer's website and it's worth making sure you've got the right one for your camera. Here we see a, um, an image. This is without a log, without a LUT. If we then apply the camera LUT, as if by magic, we get a nice image. And as you can see, it's got us a pretty good way towards a nice grade just by applying the grade, by applying the LUT. Artistic LUTs are easily created by the grading software and may be supplied to the person making dailies or the rushes for the offline editor to give the offline the look of the, the cinematographer intends. Uh, as I say, they're, they're usually created by grading software. This is a camera LUT again, uh, looks really nice to start with. We're going to apply an artistic LUT. This is the good old famous Osiris K31. It's a little bit blockbustery. It gives the teal, the teal and teal and orange look. Um, so that's what that one's done. Um, this is the Kodak film stock emulation LUT. This has given it a fairly gritty look. Uh, might be nice for a really hard drama or something like that. Um, these LUTs are available. These these LUTs are supplied with your um, with your Nikoda Academy, so you can play with those. LUT formats, there's millions of them. Um, DaVinci Resolve uses .q, DV Nucoda uses .cms. One of the things you can do if you know your camera's an ARRI and you've, you've, you've agreed a show LUT, you can upload the show LUT into the Alexa so that its LUTed output will have your show LUT applied. And in order to do that, you need to convert them to a .aml file. Um, both of the pro softwares I'm about to show you support that, so that's no problem. This Panasonic VLUT is a .VLT and Pandora Pogel is M3D. That's just to name a few. There's an awful lot of different LUT formats. So I hear you say, how am I going to get between all these formats? Um, for the Mac, there's a really nice conversion software called Lattice. That enables you to put your LUT in and select your output format, which in our case is .cms for new coder, and it'll, it'll, it'll convert it to a .cms LUT. There's another nice one out there, which is um, free, and it's Windows. Um, it's called Gross Grade. Uh, it makes really nice uh, new coder LUTs. Um, it's a very, very comprehensive program. I've played it, played with it quite a bit. It's quite fun. You can do a lot of good things with it. So uh, if you're on Windows, well worth a free download and a play. Raw files. Raw files are generated by some cameras that are capable of saving the raw sensor data. This data, when imported into the grading system, becomes highly pliable in grading. Cameras capable of doing this in, in, include the RED system and the ARRI Alexa when fitted with the RAW option. A RAW file contains considerable amounts of data. I always refer to it as like a Pandora's box. When you open it, it kind of sprays everywhere. The image data also requires something called debayering, which is re really, really processor intensive. So it's completely normal to decode to a lesser quality for the grade and only decode to full quality to the export. Red raw files are known as .r3d files and they're known to the new coder and they own their own, their own special dialogue and properties pan, pan, uh, tag, as does the ARRI, the ARRI raw file. 
So why do we need to color grade? So first thing, to match shots taken at different times of the day. You start grading, you start shooting in the morning, the day goes on, the, we, have a, we have a few problems and whatever, and soon, soon get to lunchtime. And so the lights change completely. So the, sh the, the shots to the left of the scene look completely different to the shots taken on the right of the scene. Um, you need to sort it out in the grade. Second thing, you can, uh, to match shots taken in different weather. You start shooting in the morning, it's a nice sunny day. As you carry on across the day, it clouds over, and by the end of the day, it's raining. So you've got to try and grade around that. Um, I used to have a terrible job persuading, I used to grade quite a few uh, comedy and LE shows, and I used to have a terrible job in explaining to one of my exec producers that I couldn't fix shot when he'd shot one scene, that on one side of the scene, it was a bright sunny day, and on the other side of the scene, the pavements are wet where it chucked it down with rain, and he could never understand what I couldn't fix, why I couldn't fix this. Um, uh, eight series later, I still hadn't got it through to him. <laughs> to match shots shot on different cameras. Um, classic thing, you shoot the show all on one camera, and suddenly the exec says, I really, really need another interview, and I really, really need an extra couple of shots. So you go back to the location, the camera isn't available, you shoot it on a different camera. So you've suddenly got to match different cameras. The other thing you might be matching is, say, an A camera and a B camera of different brands and things like that. So again, as I say, to match different cameras. Another thing that's really common these days uh, when budgets get tight, archive, you get lots of archive, and uh, it's quite common to need to match in archive. Uh, dependent on the sort, source, archive varies between where being good, bad, or indifferent, and you, it's your job as colorist to sort of sort it all out. The other thing is the other the other thing we, we need to grade for is this common requirement that we use today is to change the pictures artistically to give them a look. And that's a really common requirement today when you're doing drama and things like that. So what to look for when we're grading an image. This is a normal graded image. As we can see from the scopes, there's no black and white cut clip crushing and the video is a good level. We've got a little bit of space under it between 0 and 1 to 8. We've got a little bit of space between the 896 and the 1023. It's a nice picture. Unfortunately, this one's lifted. This is what a picture looks like, which has got excessive lift. You can see between 0 and 256, there's a big hole underneath the video. And as, as the result, you've got this very milky, desaturated look. And, and you'd fail your quality check if you submitted, submitted the image like it. Next one is called, what I've called low gain. As you can see, the image looks dingy. Um, it's only peaking about 640. Um, it would work for an evening shot or an early morning shot or something like that. But for an average shot in a program, it looks dingy and you need to bring the gain up. This is what happened if we brought the gain up too far. Um, as you can see, our white on the bridge is completely crushed. Um, we can actually see at 1023, we can see the, the image brightens up on the, the scope and we can see we're crushing really hard. And this is what's called white crushing. And it looks horrible, it's not very nice at all. This is the opposite, this is black crushing. And as you can see, the bright up this time is at the blacks. The blacks have gone really clipped and really hard. The, the image looks really contrasty not very nice at all and again you'd fail your quality check if you submitted your image like this. So primary correction, the first level of correction we call primary correction and in, in that mode we, 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 we can alter what's called the lift which is the density of the shadow detail, the gain which is the overall brightness of the picture the gamma, which is the density of the mid-tone detail. And I, I cannot understate the gamma has a really important artistic effect on the picture. And we have to be really mindful of that. And we'll see that when we grade. The saturation, so if we've shot it and it's a bit all too bright and colourful, we can turn down the saturation and the hue. In most terms, we won't, we won't need to touch the hue very much. The useful thing for hue as a primary correction is old NTSC material. Old NTSC material can, oft, can often have rather violent hue errors, and that can be fixed in the primary corrector. 
secondary correction. Once we've done the primary correction, we move on to secondary color correction. With the primary correction, if any color is altered, all the colors in the image will be altered. In secondary color correction, only the color specified is affected. So if I, if I qualify, say, the red, then only the red will be, of the image will be affected. And it's totally normal to qualify that red with a key, a shape, or something similar to restrict the amount of red, say, that I'm affecting. As before, any of the usual parameters can be changed, lift, gain, gamma, hue, or saturation. Very, very powerful, and we use it a lot. Grading is like building houses. First you dig the foundations, then you put up the walls, then you put up the roof trusses, and then you put on the roof. Good grading is similar. First you get the black and white levels correct, then you, then you adjust the primary color balance, and then only when the previous two are correct, work on the secondaries. If you jump in with the secondary straight away, your keying will fall apart when you adjust the primaries. Um, as I say, like building houses, just take it once, take it in, a, in, in order as one step at a time. That's the end of that little bit. Let's move, let's put, put it back to me. Um, one of the things you'll find useful when you get into grade, one of the things that you'll need to get into straight away is whether, whether you want a panel. And I have to say, my, I've got my little uh, tangent to help me. Uh, works really well with um, uh, New Coder Academy and uh, will we'll help you no end. Let's share the next screen. Sorry, I'm just sharing the screen. Right. Right, here we go with new coder. So we've run up new coder, we've got it running. First thing we need to do to uh, open our first ever timeline is to, um, is to check the screen preferences. So if we go to project, we go to, sorry, we go to preferences, and we go to monitoring. If you've got two screens, you can enable the dual display, or if you've only got one screen, enable the single display. Because of the restrictions of Zoom, I'm going to keep it on single display so you can see what I'm, what I'm up to. So now I'm going to set up my first project. I know about my material. I choose, um, so I, I know that it's video log. So I'm going to, so it's log material. So I'm going to select video log here. What I'm going to do also is select video legal. So I'm going to select video legal for video legal range. So scale to video. I know it's 1920, 1080 and it's 178. So I've got, it's got 1080p collected. It's 25 grams per second. It's 10 bits. The difference is it's log and I'm going to use a LUT. So I'm going to put a LUT on this. So I'm going to change um, to LUT. And I'm going to go to Black Magic because it's Black Magic material shot on a Black Magic camera. And I'm going to show it a BMCC to Rec 709 LUT. And I'm going to click on Apply to apply that LUT. And as you see on my output, I've now got a 1920 by 1080 output. It's 10 bit, it's 1778 aspect ratio, and it's got a LUT applied. I can now open my project. So if I go to open and say yes, my project will open. So now what I'm going to do is import some media. And the way I'm going to do that is to use an AAF. An AAF is like a, an EDL on steroids. It tells uh, New Coder where to find all the files to reconform the, off, the, the timeline to match the offline. Your offline or NLE Will it will is will export an AAF? Uh, Avid will export an AAF. If you're coming from Premiere, I mm, Premiere used to struggle to export an AAF. If you're coming from Premiere, I'd come with an XML. New Coder understands XML, no problems at all. Uh, Final Cut Pro is XML as well. As I say, New Coder understands it; it's not a problem. We're going to come from an AAF. So I'm going to go to the media ray where I've hidden it, DV, 
and Ah, it's my AF. Right, so I've got my AF file, Bloomsbridge AAF. Uh, you see it's got a little AAF on the end. If I import that, it's going to ask me to get ready to conform it. Next thing I need to do is show it where the media is. And I'm going to show it that, and it's on the D drive, and it's under, um, under media, and it's under Bloomsbridge. And I'm going to say OK to that. So that's where my rushes are. I'm going to confirm all events into a new composition and I'm going to say import and there it is conforming away. Pretty quick. So it's importing the media and doing it. I'm going to say close to that and I've got my timeline. So there's my timeline. What I'll now do is go to memories here and I've got my picture and I can see if the picture doesn't come up if you right click and click on fit you'll get a picture and I've got my scopes to the left so I'll look at my first picture and it's a tiny bit contrasting so what I'll do is just put a bit of mid-tones the blacks aren't too bad it's the mid-tones so I'm going to stretch the mid-tones a bit and I'll use my panel to do that because it's more an easier way to do it. I'm going to take my gain down a little bit. Let's move that to the side because you can't see. And now I've got a bit more range in my image. And I go on to my second image. Now this I was deliberate when I shot it, I was deliberately trying to save the sky. So my mid-tones again are a bit dark. So I'm going to bring up the mid-tones and as you see it's starting to look quite nice. I'll bring down the low lights. And I just sort of save those highlights. And I've now got quite a nice image. Third image, uh, a tiny bit mid-tone crushed, so I'm just going to bring down the mid-tone. Um, as you can see, this is this is a good image, and as you see, if I if I put too much lift in it, you see it goes milky. And if I bring the lift down, again it all crushes down, and you black crush. So I'm aiming for that nice value where it looks nice. On the gain front, I can put more and more gain out, but as you see straight away up, up by the two tower blocks, you're starting to see the sky burning out and I'm losing all that nice high, that nice sky detail. So I want to come down. I'm going to come down to about there. So I've got all that nice, nice sky detail and my narrow bow is looking nice now. So I've got a nice image. So onto my third image. Again, I've, I've exposed this for the sky. So I'm going to bring up the mid-tones. I'll put, bring up a tiny bit on the shadows and that's now starting to look quite nice. There's nothing in the sky, so that's that. Go on to my fourth shot. Oh dear, yes. Plenty in these pictures. So again, I'll take that down and I've got quite a nice image now. This one was intended to be dark. The, the, the footpath's not very visible, so. It's just a not fairly nice image. A nice image of the bridge. Tiny bit more gain, perhaps, just to bring it up to the highlights. Yeah. So it's all about getting a nice even level on our timeline. Just bringing up the mid-tones, making it look nice. Mm, it's really nice, I'm hardly going to touch that. Bring up the mid-tones a little bit and just crush the blacks a little bit and that'll look nice. This one, the flare has gone down the lens. So I'm going to crush it a little bit just to get rid of the flare. And just stretch the mid-tones and that's a much nicer image unless you like the flare some people like the flare again a little bit flary it was getting towards the end of the day and the sun was coming down 
There we go, that's quite nice. Try to stretch the mid tones. And our last shot, a bit dark, it was really the end of the day by that point. So my whole timeline is now nicely equalized to a nice, nice even level. So what I'm thinking now is, well, I might want to export that. So I go back to library and I go to export media. And I show it where I'm going to export it. So I'm going to show it media raid. I'm going to show it. Code a render. I'm going to give it a title and I'm going to show it what format I'm going to. You, um, on Nucoda Academy, you just get ProRes and you get ProRes LT. Um, and that will be the format you can export in. Uh, you put a title here and I'd press export. I'm not going to do it because when you share a screen, it doesn't export, it just, it just crashes. So I'm not going to do that. Um, so I won't export that and crash it, but that's how you, how you do an export. And obviously once you've got that exported, you can look at it in either, um, QuickTime, uh, QuickTime player or VLC player or whatever, and it'll all be nicely graded. One of the other things we can do is if we've got our shot and we really like it, and let's pick, go, go back to uh, Mems again and pick a nice shot. There's a nice shot. We like that shot. So let's say that um, our, our, our cinematographer particularly likes that and says, well, I've got quite a lot else that I should. Can I have a copy of the LUT? All you need to do is go to library and export LUT CDL, give it a destination again, uh, tell it what format, be it CMS, Cube, or Cube. Um, Nucoder uh, is .cms. .cube is widely supported by quite a few other things, and you can save it. And that will get that will export that 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 LUT for future use. Um, if you're going to something really weird, you may need to go through um, Lattice or uh, Gross Grade to conform it, but it's to convert it. So that's a, a little 101 on grading and doing things. Um, and, and you should now, that will give you the practice about grading, getting the overall levels correct. And it's getting these levels correct, which is so important, because then you can build on that to do the color, and then you can build on that to do the secondaries. And if you do this in this order, you'll get, you'll, you'll get a really nice grade and it won't fall or fall apart around your ears. As I said, I've said it once and I'll say it again, grading's like building houses. You build the foundations first, then you build the walls, then you build the, build the roof trusses, then you put the tiles on. If you do it in the right order, it won't fall on your head and come apart at the seams. And it's a really good way to work. I'll hand back to Thea for some questions. Lovely, thank you, Chris. So we will have a little Q&A session here now for about 10 minutes. If anyone wants to, you should be able to see it at the bottom of your screen there if you want to type away. While we're waiting for those, Chris, you'll be doing another two sessions with us on yeah, color. Yeah, that's right. Grading. Yeah, yeah. So the second one will deal with the actual color grading of the color part of it, and the third one will talk about the secondaries and perhaps giving th giving something a look. So it will be in three stages, and we'll have a time. We'll we'll use our timeline again and again. And we ought to say that the timeline is downloadable. We're going to make that available to you. The Black Magic LUTs available to work with it. And um, that'll all be a downloadable to put in your Nakoda Academy and follow these sessions. Excellent. So we have a few questions here. Um, what is the approximate expected time for a feature film? I.e. how long do I tell people it will take to grade? Right. Feature, for, I mean, I've heard all sorts of, I mean, it depends what you're doing, but if you're starting from scratch and it's shot in raw or something similar, I think you're talking about probably 
I mean, the, the good guys, I'm told, get a week of reel. And it, you, you probably got a five reeler, so five weeks. Um, back, in, back in the old days, I used to get a day to do a 90 minuter, um, which is a bit of a different cat of fish. Um, you, you've got far more to think about these days. Um, your bare minimum is a week, but I would think two weeks bare minimum. Um, from Edu. Is it possible to have a new Coda demo to try? Uh, yes, we yes. offer new Coda Academy, which is basically the educational version of new Coda. Um, so we'll be sending out an email after this webinar, which will have details about how to get in touch with us about getting a license. Um, from Francesca, do you usually balance the shots before the client sits in? It's nice. I mean, I used to do that a lot when when um, we were working on film, and it was really a really nice way to get started. Um, I like the client to give me some idea of what he's after. Um, the, the, it all comes apart when 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 something like the cinematographer turns up and has a completely different view on what I had on it, and it all came apart. Uh, comes apart. So I it I do when it's a production I'm used to working with. If it's a production I'm not used to working with, it, then I'd get nervous about doing it. I think it depends on your relationship as the colorist with the client. Excellent. Um, we have a question from Shashank. If the sky is burned out, in what case, what are we going to do? Shashank, you can't do much. If it's gone, it's gone, mate. Hard luck. Um, <laughs> um, it's, uh, you can try and stretch something out of it. There are things you can do. Uh, you can struggle and try to get things things out of it, but really, if the cameraman has really banged it into the limiters, it's gone, and and there's nothing you can do. It's one of the faults of video. If you're on film and you've got log files, you may find you can stretch something out of it because film has an incredible latitude. You might just get something out of it, but I'm afraid it's one of the faults. It's the limiter, classic limitation of video. Um, from Mahak, when can we use Nakoda on Max? That is an excellent question. I will leave that for Mark to answer <laughs> later on. Can you make the PowerPoint screens you showed downloadable? Yes, we will have a PDF that we will be sending out um, in an email after this webinar. You will be receiving it tomorrow. Um, from Dean, I use Phoenix mostly as I work in film restoration and occasionally tasked with basic grading jobs. Are files compatible with both Nucoda and Phoenix? Are the tools in Nucoda available in Phoenix? I'm not sure. Mark will have to answer that. I'm not sure of the differences between um, Phoenix and Nucoda. Um, so I can jump in there, Chris. Yeah, you jump in, Mark. Yes, they are compatible with both programs. Uh, so you can do uh, Nucoda work uh, and then go onto a Phoenix system if you want. Nice and simple. Excellent. So are the Nucoda tools available in Phoenix then, Mark? Uh, yes, uh, they are, depending on what Phoenix you have. Um, if you go for um, a Phoenix uh, Refine or video, they have uh, one layer of color grading you can do on there and a Phoenix Finish has the complete uh, color tool set uh, that we do in Nucoda and it's only the Phoenix Touch that doesn't have the any color tools whatsoever. So we have a question from Gustavo. Can you talk about the differences with color settings during a project setup? Why use video log instead of film log, for example? Right, I used, I used video log because my films are, my files are video and they're video log. Film log is, is, is the correct setting for Cineon files. And that would be, a, uh, that, that would have come from a film scanner or something similar. My films came from a Blackmagic video camera and a video log. Um, 
so that's the difference between the two different two different log settings. Um, you'd use, you, as I say, you'd use film log for um, uh, files that, that that are Cineon. Um, we have someone saying that Sky replacement is possible via a key on Nucoda. Yeah, I mean it's you can you, you can um, you can you can key the Sky and then pull it down and try and work on it and see if you can in the secondaries and see if you can do more with it and things like that. But yes. Um, from Rajendra, what special features does Nucoda have in comparison with competitive grading solutions in the industry? I think in the full version of Nucoda, you get the restoration tools and the restoration tools are unique in the industry. Um, they are very, very, very powerful uh, for dust busting, for noise removal. I mean, the, the, the noise reducer is just industry leading. It's the best in the business. DVO Clarity is the business. It really does a brilliant job. It's very, very good. Um, the other tools are really useful for removing dropouts, for, for, for doing video restoration work, um, for doing all manner of weird, for fixing all manner of things like dead pixels and things like that. Those tools are unique. Resolve and Baselight and things like that doesn't have those tools available. Um, that they are just unique to Nucoda. From uh, Shashank, after the color grade, if edits change, what is the process to change the edit in the grade? Changing the edit in the grade is, um, I think probably the best words to, to say that is not recommended. I think you've got to think of picture lockers. Pick. We, one of the things we try and infuse on our students at the film school these days is picture, you've got to re respect picture lock. The easiest way, if you've got this, and the only way to do it with Nucoda if you've got this, is if your exec has walked in and said, I need another two, I need two minutes out of it, and I need to alter the thing, I need a, an extra interview, and I need a big change at the day before the grade, is grade the version as is, export it as is, grade any additional material and sort, sort it out in an online. Don't attempt to try and fix it in the grade. Uh, you won't do it, it'll make a horrible mess and the conform will be a complete nightmare. Uh, fix it in the online and it's a far better way to do it. You, your editor will be able to make a, a little AF with the old stuff and the new stuff together that will put it back together in the right order. The new coder will cope with grading both bits. And because you've already got all the settings and everything for the, for the, for the new material, you'll be able to grade it to match the old material and export two little export. You'll be able to export your main show and your new material and the online editor will just be able to put the two bits together to make the finished product. Nice and easy. So we have a question about LUTs. If a LUT is in place on the setup, are all the images affected? And if some are not log, what happens if some are not log recorded images? Will they be affected? Right, if you, if you apply the LUT on the initial page, then yes, it applies it on all images. If you've got a mixed timeline where half the images are, 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 are log and half the images aren't, there's a way around it um, which uh, I'll show you next time. Show you that. Show you how to do that. It's it's to it's to do with the um, with with adding um, a, additional little color nodes to do it. But yes, it's easy enough to do. Okay. Um, from Shashank again. I am shifting from Final Cut Pro Avid to DaVinci. Is in editing is editing possible in Nucoda? Rudimentary editing is possible, but I. I've personally, I've always found it to be a scary incident, a scary experience. You can easily get your on, you can easily get things wrong and export, do an export that isn't right. That the following morning you've got the online editor screaming at you because it's wrong. I, I avoid it. I must admit, I stick with, I stick with the concept that the, the, the AAF is final. I confirm the AAF and I export that as as true to the online and leave the online editor to make changes if they're needed. It's a far, far safer method of working. Lovely, thank you. 
Well, that concludes our webinar, I believe. Thank you for all the questions. Um, as we said before, we will be sending out an email with some additional um, materials and a PDF of what Chris covered today, as well as the recording of this webinar, so you can go back and watch through it again for anything. And we will be doing two more in this session as well, um, in this series. Right, Chris? Yes, that's right. Excellent. We'll be back for color and back for looks and secondaries. Lovely. So thank you very much for everyone attending and we'll see you next time.